Our loving Father in heaven, we love you because you first loved us. Father, we're so grateful that we are your children at your invitation. As we assemble in your presence, dear God, we ask you please, for the sake of Christ, for the sake of the truth, for the sake of hearts that will be converted, teach us, enlighten us. Lord, tear down the Jericho walls of resistance, stubbornness and opposition, and let the truth go marching in. Take up residence and occupation in our hearts. Lead our lives and save us at last. Grant me the words to say. I offer this prayer from my heart in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Amen. Go with me to Genesis chapter 4. We shall begin reading at verse 1. Genesis chapter 4, reading from verse 1. Do you have it? The Bible says, And Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bare a son, and said, And I have gotten a man from the Lord. Conceived and bare Cain, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth? And why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. And Cain talked with Abel his brother. And it came to pass when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. And now art thou cursed from the earth, which hath opened her mouth, to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. This is the first passage in scripture where we are informed of the birth of siblings. Genesis 4, 1, onward. In this passage, there is a word or an expression that is used seven times. That is not used with that frequency in any other list of sibling births. Now, the longest list of births is that of Jacob, who had 12 sons. Now, I'm not saying Jacob had the most children. Uh, Gideon had 72 sons. That's a lot of children. But the longest recorded list of each child is Genesis 29, 31 to 35, and chapter 30, 1 to 24. Of course, way down in chapter 35, we have the birth of Benjamin, during which time Rachel died. When you read the account of the birth of the children of Jacob, Genesis 29, reading from verse 31 down to 35, we have Leah giving birth to children. And Leah conceived and bare a son. And Leah conceived again and bare a son. Verse 34, and she conceived again and bare a son. The Bible doesn't say, and she bare a son who was the brother of. You don't find the word brother. But for some reason in Genesis 4, the first 11 verses, the word brother is used seven times. Let's go over the passage. Let's identify these seven references to brother and try to find out why. And Adam knew Eve his wife and she conceived and bare Cain and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare, what? His brother, Abel. That's number one. Someone keep count. And Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. 
And Abel he also brought of the firstlings of his flock, and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering, but unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth, and why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. Verse 8. And Cain talked with Abel his brother. And it came to pass, when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel his brother, and slew him. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And Cain said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. And now art thou cursed from the earth, which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. What is God saying to us? As we continue with the subject, which I'm mentioning for the first time, who was that man without a keeper? What does God want us to learn from Genesis 4, 1 to 11? Now, God is very famous for asking questions. Now, we generally tend to accuse people, but God prefers to ask questions. And so even though God knew what Adam had done, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 9, the Bible says, And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, You did something wrong. What does the Bible say? Where art thou? You tell me. No accusations, just questions. You tell me. And when Adam said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the fruit and I did eat. The Lord God said unto the woman, You did your husband wrong. What did God say to Eve? What hast thou done? Tell me. Talk to me. I'm listening. God does not accuse all the time. Sometimes he gives us an opportunity to tell him what's going on. Now, when God came to Adam in Genesis 3 verse 9, the Bible says, And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? God was asking Adam to give an account of himself. Tell me your condition. Tell me what's going on. Tell me how are things with you. Tell me about you. But in Genesis 4 verse 9, the Bible says, And the Lord God said unto Cain, Where is whom? In Genesis 4 now, we have God asking one man about another man. We have God asking one church member about the spiritual condition about another member. Now, some Christians like to leave, lead their Christian lives with a sense of complete independence from everyone else. What I do is my business. You want to eat pork? That's your business. You want to smoke? That's your business. You want to live with a woman? That's your business. You want to believe the world was created in seven million years? That's your business. But the Bible has no room for that's your business. Not if that's the way you and I live our lives. The Bible has a lot of room for what happens to you is my business. And so God came to Cain. Asking not about Cain, but about Abel. Every Christian member of the church has a responsibility before God to, to know what's going on with his brother or his sister without being a meddler in other men's affairs, according to Peter. God doesn't call us to be nosy. God calls us to be caring. God doesn't call us to be inquisitive. God calls us to be concerned. One man concerned for the other is part of the way the church must function. There must be no one in the church who lives as if no one cares about me. So God has every right to say, bless, where's Janwar? 
to say, Lady, where's Ellen? And Lady can't say, I'm busy. Why don't you ask Ellen's mother? The Lord said, no, if I wanted to ask Ellen's mother, I would have gone directly to Ellen's mother. I am asking you, as her sister in Christ, you tell me about her spiritual condition. Don't you realize she hasn't been to church for four consecutive Sabbaths? Have you called? Have you sent a card? Have you visited? Tell me about Ellen. And you better have something to say. Every church, there are people who are lonely. They sit in a crowd and lonely. No one invites them to potluck. No one invites them to their homes. They're not part of the popular cliques. They're not part of the inner circle. They might as well worship in a desert with coyotes and, and Gila monsters. Because no one cares and God's heart is broken. And so God said to Cain, where is Abel thy brother? And Abel, and Cain said what many of us say without actually using words, but we say it by our attitudes. I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? There are some questions God does not waste time answering. Because the answer is so obvious. When Cain said, am I my brother's keeper? The obvious answer is yes. That's why the word brother is used so frequently in chapter 4 verses 1 through 11. God wants to hammer home the teaching that we are brothers one to the other and we are sisters one to the other. Even a husband and a wife in the sight of God are also brother and sister. Which means then, we are members of the same family. So God said, Cain, where is Abel? I don't know and I don't care. I'm not his keeper. God said, what hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. Now you and I may say, I have never risen up in the field and slain anyone. There's more, there are more than one ways to, uh, there's more than one way to kill a person. We can kill a person's spirit. We can kill a person's desire to serve God. We can kill a student's desire to study and do well. We can discourage a person to the point the person leaves the church, goes into the world, never comes back, and will be in the flames of hell. We can kill people that way. And we do. Murderers and vegetarians. God said, the voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. And now art thou cursed from the earth, which hath opened her mouth, to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. Are there members' blood from this church crying out to God? Because other members have spilled their bloods by attitudes. I work for the government, you are unemployed, I can't talk to you. I have this, you don't have it, we can't associate. I drive this, you drive that, we can't talk. All my children are in dental school, yours went to a Bible teacher school, we can't associate. And our heavenly father, who's father of all, he looks down from heaven, his heart broken in a thousand little divine pieces, and his glistening tears fall from his divine eyes, almost unwilling to look upon this scene of carnage and one person destroying the other. Yet we come every Sabbath, well-dressed, as we destroy one another, well-dressed. If you're going to do it, look good doing it. There is something that God created for our good. It is called influence. Let me tell you something you already know. God has arranged it that people will influence other people. Are you listening to me? That's why you tell your children, don't associate with that young boy who smokes dope. Because you know, if your young son associates long enough, Nine out of ten times, he'll be smoking dope too, rather than his friend coming to church. That's the way it works. 
That's why God told the Israelites, don't mingle with those Canaanites. They will take you from me. God never said, you'll bring them to me. They will take you from me. That's the way it works. And so parents are very aware of influence, and so we guard the friends our children have. Because friends influence friends. When I was in medical school counseling on my favorite students, her uncle was in medical school, he was 60. So I asked her, why is your uncle in medical school at 60? She said, well, all his friends have a doctor in the family. And he felt beneath them. So in order to keep up, he went to medical school. Struggling at 62, 63, 64 to finish neuroanatomy and do a residency. Why? Because he felt the pressure to keep up. So he's in medical school too. Influence. It does not only occur among the young. Let me pick on the young boys. Don't get upset. I love you. You're my brothers. You know why young boys wear their pants falling off? You know why? Not because Jesus did it. No. Not because the Apostle Paul did it. Because those rappers. They wear their pants falling off. Now let me tell you this. And If tonight all rappers got on TV and said, Man, wearing your pants falling off, that is... Whatever the, the, the word is, whack. <laughs> is that a word? That's whack. <laughs> By tomorrow, all pants would come up. Because no one likes to look out of step with the fashion set by the godly rappers. Influence. Let me jump on the young girls. Don't hate me, I'm your brother in Christ. Why do Christian young ladies try to wear the pants as low down as possible? Low riders. Not because the Virgin Mary wore that. Mm. Not because Eve was dressed that way in the garden. No, because some girl on TV, some so-called supermodel, someone on a runway looking like a skeleton wore this thing. And now all the children in God's church must have themselves half exposed. And so you have a cleavage here and a cleavage back there. I have to show it. Influence. But no one looks at Jesus for guidance. He's too boring. He's too covered up. The Virgin Mary? <laughs> Virgin? <laughs> nah. Give me Madonna or whomever. <laughs> Little Kim, Big Kim. Give me one of those. <laughs> Influence is something God invented, but for our growth. Now, Jesus understood that, and as brothers and sisters, our lives must be lived in such a way that the effect we have on people is an effect that builds them up. Come on, say amen. amen. Don't you understand, don't I understand, by our lives we can lead people straight to hell. You know, I've always said, as a preacher, there's some things I just won't ever let people see me do. Now, I don't go to the movies. Say amen. amen. Say it again. Amen. Say it again. Amen. I don't go to the movies. All those who don't go to the movies, let me see your hands. Mm -hmm, we have some sinners going to talk to you. I don't go to the movies. I don't go to Las Vegas to gamble. Doesn't mean I'm a saint. I just don't do these things. Now, if there were a movie that I had to see before I die, I wouldn't go to a movie house in Ann Arbor. I'd fly to Japan. Korea where no one knows me. So I could not shake up anyone's religion. Are you listening to me? No one could say, wait a minute. I saw Elder Skeet going to the movies. Well, movies, here I come. <laughs> That's the way we are. Now when God said to Cain, where's Abel? Cain should have said, oh, Father in heaven, Abel is studying the Bible. Because he saw me studying it. Abel is preparing a vegetarian dish under the tree of life because he saw me. Abel is now taking care of the sheep and he, he saw me. Abel is now respecting his mother Eve because he noticed I respect my mother. Hey, that's what Cain should have said. I don't know, says Cain. Here's what Jesus has to say about that as we continue with who was that man without a keeper. Let's go to Matthew 18. Reading from verse 1. Who was that man without a keeper? Matthew 18 is quarter to five. 
Reading from verse 1. At the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called the little child unto him and set him in the midst of them and said, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself, like this little child, the same is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoso shall receive one such little child in my name, receiveth me. Now verse 6. But. Is that the first word in verse 6? What does but mean? Something completely different is coming. Now Jesus was a nice man. He said a lot of nice things. People hit him and he took it. They spat on him, he took it. They kicked him, he took it. They called him names, he took it. By the way, the Christian must learn to take stuff. If you live your Christian life like this, always trying to protect yourself, you will not represent God properly. The Christian must learn to take stuff even when we know that's what the person has in mind. Did Jesus know what Judas had in mind? Yes or no? Yes. How did he treat Judas? With love. We are not called upon to fight off every attack. What did Jesus say? If anyone shall smite thee on thy right cheek, do what? Turn the other one. And if any man shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. But the, because of the sinful nature, we are quick to say, do you know who I am? <laughs> do you know who I am? I am the head janitor of the school. Do you know who I am? Now, when they were insulting Jesus, Jesus had every right to say, do you know who I am? How many times did he say that? Not once. Now that's meekness. That's humility. But our urge is to let people know how big we are. And how bad we are. Jesus, with all the power to show how big he was. And how bad he was. He just took it. He just took it. He just took it. Let me tell you something. The Bible teaches that we are called upon by God to be like that. And if I had time, I'd preach that sermon. Now, I am not saying that we buy a t-shirt which says, I am a mat, walk on me. I am not saying that. <laughs> I am saying that the part of Christian living is to react to hardships in such a different way that people begin to wonder, what's wrong with this man? Nothing's wrong with him. Everything is right with him. Something's wrong with you who are making his life miserable. And God will deal with you. Matthew 18, 6. But whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he were drowned in the depths of the sea. Jesus, now to offend, in the, the first line of verse 6 of Matthew 18, to offend means to cause someone to stumble. We can do that by the way we dress. We can do it by the way we eat. The way we spend our money. If I, we can do that in so many ways, cause a weak Christian to stumble. Jesus says, anyone who causes some Christian, to stumble, it were better for that person that a millstone were hanged about the neck and that person is better to die than to lead someone down the path to destruction. Verse 7, Jesus says, War unto the world because of offenses. For it must needs be that offenses come. In other words, things happen. That's the world in which we live. Things go wrong. People mess up. Yes, Jesus admits these things happen, but he said, but woe to that man by whom the offense cometh. Christ is saying, look, stuff happens, yes, but you don't be the person through whom the stuff comes. Stuff happens in church, yes. Don't let the devil use you to create some stuff in church. Are you listening to me? Stuff happens. Jesus confessed it. But he said, it does not have to happen through me or through you. 
So that if the church is about to split north and south, if God comes down to check what happened, you must be able to say, Father, I had nothing to do with it. That stuff did not come through me. If someone is somewhere in downtown Los Angeles, drunk as a fish, and God comes down to look at this soul for whom Jesus died, and he says, my son, why are you in this condition? That person may say, well, I used to attend the uh, Upland Indonesian Seventh-day Adventist Church, and a certain, some people treated me badly. I was so discouraged, I left. Then God comes to the church to find out who they were. Make sure you're not one. That stuff didn't come through me. Yes, Jesus says, offenses will come, but woe to that man by whom the offense... Never be the source. Never be the avenue through which the devil works. Never. Some members of the church, you know, they, they, they almost wear their trouble like bars. The sergeant, I was a corporal last year, I caused a little more trouble, now I'm a something. A little more trouble this year, now I'm a sergeant. I just wait next year to be a lieutenant. Cause all the trouble in the church. I have my stripes. So when I walk in, people go quiet. Here he comes. Caiaphas. Shh, be quiet. God views that very, very harshly. We are brothers. We are sisters. Let me ask all of us a very troubling question. Is it possible there is anyone who will be lost as a result of your influence? Don't, don't, don't answer. Don't answer. My question is, has it already happened? Think of this. How many of you are in school? Can I see your hands? You're attending some school, primary school, kindergarten, something. College. University. <laughs> My apologies, Dr. Bless. Okay. Jesus comes back, the holy city comes down. All the saved are in the holy city, and you are there. In, outside the city, is a young man who used to sit right next to you in class. He would see you cheat. And he was so influenced by your bad behavior, knowing you're Christian, he started to cheat too. And cheating in class led to gambling, gambling led to theft. Theft led to prison and his life went. At some point you repented and the Lord fixed you up and that guy was still gone. Now Christ has come. Hail and brimstone are about to come down and the young man sees the fire coming. Then he turns and he sees you on the walls of Jerusalem safe and he wonders why is he there? And I'm here. This was the guy who taught me how to cheat. And some woman sees the fire coming. And she turns, looks on the wall, and sees some sister in the church. This was the woman who influenced me to spend all my money on fashion. And I gave nothing to the church. Now why is she here? And I'm about to burn. Why? Something's not right. I am saying to us, this is very, very serious. It is very possible. When Jesus comes to destroy the wicked, some people will be destroyed for no other reason than we give them a bad example. And that's a horrible thing to think. Ellen White writes, I forget exactly where she wrote it. She said, in the judgment, many parents will be shocked to learn that what their lost children became they were chiefly responsible. Don't you know your children see how much you work and how little of the Bible you study? They see that. Now you think because they're 8 and 9, it doesn't register. You're making a sad mistake. He's only 10. He doesn't pay attention to the fact that I don't study the Bible. Oh yes, he does. He does. But he won't see anything. Because you're his mother. Now when he's 18 and about to leave the church and you're begging the pastor to pray and fast. Oh, they see. My parents work so much they have no time for church. No Sabbath keeping, no opening the Sabbath, no closing the Sabbath, no nothing. They just buy me things to keep me out of their hair so they can do their work. And, uh, and uh, they, they see it as they grow up with the conviction, spiritual things 
are not important to my family. Therefore, they are not important to me. And they grow to the age when you no longer have control and they leave. And we wonder what happened. We want everyone on earth to pray for our children. We are our brother's keeper. We are our children's keeper. We are one another's keeper. There must be no one in the church who is without a keeper. My brothers and my sisters, in Psalm 133 verse 1, the psalmist says, How pleasant and how good a thing it is for brethren to dwell together how? In unity. Unity of mind. Unity of purpose. Unity of direction. Unity of soul. Unity in the decision to die rather than to dishonor God. Unity in the determination to serve God, glorify God, honor God, be Christ-like. Oneness in mind. This was the way they were when Pentecost came. Not simply in one room, but in one place, spiritually. This is what God wants for you. There are people watching you on your job. Be one with the Spirit. Shed the right influence. Be your colleague's keeper by being faithful to the standards of Christ. In the church, let's be one in our determination to serve God faithfully, to abide by His law, to be obedient to Him, to to, to so live as a church that the community will want to be a part of us. At school, young men, young women, so conduct yourselves. Be in class on time. Respect the teacher when you're trying to argue for another point. Have your assignments done. Dress properly. Speak properly. Eat properly. Play properly. Be a witness. That no one may be able to say, I am lost because of you. Upland Indonesian Seventh Day Ad for this church. Where is Abel, thy brother? You better be ready to give God an answer. Because we are required to care one for the other. The book is closed, meaning I'm finishing. I believe you've gotten the message. Let me ask you an embarrassing question. Don't answer me. Is there someone here, member of this church, who does not like another member of this church? And I use the word does not like just to be kind. I really mean hate. Is there a member of this church who positively dislikes another member? And you are saved as saved can be. Your place in heaven is assured, but you hate someone in this church. Is there some family that does not talk to another family? And do you have a Bible verse to support you? Quotation from Ellen White, maybe Adventist home. All right, let me release you from silence. Feel free to answer me. Is there someone here who does not like some other member? Show yourself. Raise your hand. No, no, I'm very serious. Raise your hand. Is there someone here who does not like another member? Raise your hand. Is there someone here who is not sure I don't like another member? Raise your hand. Is this the truth? Is this the truth? Is there someone here who feels that he or she is not liked by someone else? You raise your hand. 
You think someone doesn't like you. Raise your hand. You're sure in your heart someone does not like you. You raise your hand. In this church, yes. Mm -hmm. This is where I am, this church. No one? Well, then everyone here is ready for the kingdom. Jesus comes today, we're all going to heaven. We're part of the 144,000. Stop lying. I speak to you as your brother in Christ. I am an Indonesian. Say amen. amen. <laughs> I made myself one. And there's nothing you can do to change it. Because your father is God. He's my father. If you're Indonesian, I'm Indonesian. God is Indonesian. Now. <laughs> is this the way God wants us to live? If Jesus came now, where would you go? Up or down? All those who would go up, can I see your hands? All those who would go down, can I see your hands? I want to suggest something for you. Two minutes after five. How many of you today will make a commitment? Lord, use me to be a blessing in the church. Now, is that reasonable? How many will say with me, with me, wherever I am, Father, I want to be a blessing when I go to Africa, to Tanzania, South America, Australia, England. I'm going to England this week. Is it this week? No, next week. I want to be a blessing to the people in England. I go to Bermuda in January. I want to be a blessing, not a curse. I want to be a blessing in the world I preach. I want to be a blessing in how I dress. I want to be a blessing in how I eat, how I counsel one-on-one, -on -one, how I look at you or how I not look at you. I want to be a blessing, not a curse. How many of you will say in the presence of a holy God who does not like lies, Lord, put it in my heart to be a blessing in this church. Raise your right hand. Even if you're a guest, you remember, you raise your right hand. Stand up. Now don't lie to God. Don't lie to God. Who is that man without a keeper? We must look out for one another. Not how to hurt, how to help, and how to heal. Let me recommend this to you. If there is a family you have never invited to lunch, make it your business prayerfully to invite that person sometime soon. Did you hear me? Try it. If there's someone you've not spoken to for weeks, say a prayer. Ask God to give you the words and go to the person and spend two or three minutes just talking for someone for whom Jesus shed the same blood as that which he shed for you. If you know there's someone who does not like you, ask God for power. Take a deep breath. Take a day to fast. Get some divine courage and go talk to the person. Say, hi, how are you? God bless you. I am praying for you. Don't risk eternal life on these human negative feelings that we have. Don't risk your eternal life. Eternal life is too precious to risk it on resentment and jealousy and anger and all these little things that are designed to destroy us. Eternal life is too precious. Let's not lose it. Can I tell you a secret? I love you. Somebody say amen. amen. You know why I love you? John 15, 12, this is my commandment, that you love one another. I have no choice. I love you because God commanded me, but I also love you because you're lovable. Now, can you listen to a man who loves you? Love one another. Ask God to put love in your hearts. I'll make one more appeal, then we're finished. If you will say, Lord, use me. Use me. To be a blessing to others. Use me to be a blessing. Leave your seat and come right here. If you will say, Lord, use me, come right here. Use me. And I mean use me. 
Let God use you anywhere he chooses. Use me at work, at home, at play, at school, in the community, in the market. Use me to be a blessing. You come. Use me to be a blessing. In this life, you're either blessing or curse. There's no middle ground. You're either a blessing or a curse. Lord, use me to be a blessing. I'm tired of being a curse. I'm tired of being the reason why someone else is unhappy. I'm tired of being the reason why someone wants to transfer the membership. I am tired of that. Use me to bring joy into someone's life. For Christ's sake. Every head bowed, every eye closed, as I, your brother, pray. Father in heaven, I don't know what else to say. I have spoken to my brothers and my sisters. I believe you've given me the words I've spoken. Lord, if I've misspoken at any time, I ask for your forgiveness publicly. In my heart is a desire to see you bless this church. To see you bless the young people. To see you bless the parents who have worked so hard. Who have the best interest for their children. In my heart is a desire to see you bless the leadership of this church. In my heart is a desire to see this church be a light in this community. This is all I have in my heart for this church. That has blessed me so much this week. Lord I pray for this church. I pray for every member, every child, every man, woman, boy and girl. Asking you father to hear me. As I ask you to put the love of God in their hearts. Change us God. Convert us. Let us be those who naturally, instinctively, reflexively try to bless others. Not hurt them, not curse them. Father, if there's any man or woman with difficulty loving, help that person to love as Jesus loved. Heal us, restore us. And save us, I pray. And Father, as this week ends, let us not go back to where we were. But let us move on up every day in our lives. Until that day when Jesus comes to take all of us home without losing one. I offer this prayer from my heart. In Jesus' name and for his sake, let all God's people say, Amen and Amen. God bless you. Let's sing one stanza. Sing them over again to me. Wonderful words of life. 286.